So let's begin with a little meditation. And I would really like to invite everybody just to, for a few moments, put down devices, anything of distractions, and just sit quietly and calmly. And <clears throat> And please follow the thoughts which are suggested. Let me ask my heart, how am I really feeling at the moment? What is really happening inside of me? Spirituality is about caring for my inner world. How to live in this incredibly challenging world which is changing so fast. How do I care for myself? How do I sustain myself? Sometimes it feels that so many things make me feel so physically fatigued and tired. A long list of things to do. And sometimes my energy is completely depleted. Sometimes I may feel mentally tired. So much thinking, so much analyzing, so much processing. My mind never stops. And sometimes I feel emotionally fatigued, emotionally tired. It seems relationships are so sensitive. There are so many differences and conflicts which are so exhausted. And even I can feel spiritually fatigued. Who am I really and where do I really belong? The whole role of spirituality is to help me stand strong in this incredibly fast changing world. to help me stand strong in the face of so many things that can make me feel fatigued and tired. So let us begin this evening by just relaxing. Consciously feel your mind Cool down. Just feel yourself letting go, relaxing, calming down. So thank you so much, everybody. It's really lovely to be with you. And when I look at our world, I think what 
an extraordinary world we live in. 7.9 billion human beings, 195 countries, 6,500 spoken languages, 4,500 practiced religions. How extraordinary is our world? But that is like the external world, the world which we can see and hear, the world we connect through our senses. There's another world which is equally extraordinary, and that's our inner world. Perhaps we could say the world which is beyond our senses. And that's the world of our mind, the extraordinary part of our inner world, which is the place where my whole life takes place. My whole life meets in my mind, my thoughts, my feelings, my relationships, everything. Some scientists say that the human mind creates around 70,000 thoughts in a waking day. <laughs> I'm not sure how they counted them. But just hold the image in your mind of 8 billion souls, 8 billion people, each one generating 70,000 thoughts. And we create this collective atmosphere together. It's like we are living in a thought soup, which we're all contributing to. Wherever you live in this world, we are all watching this world degenerating, this world disintegrating around us. We see it through our eyes. We hear it through our ears. But what is feeding this? It's our collective human mind. And when our collective human mind is full of greed, we create a culture of materialism that's really destroying our beautiful world, our beautiful environment. When the collective human mind is full of ego, we just have so much self-interest. Just what do I need or my immediate family? And we lose the most human of qualities to have that love and compassion for each other. When the collective human mind is full of anger, we have so much conflict in our world. And when the collective human mind is so exhausted, it feels there's a heaviness. And many of us feel there's like a, a heaviness in this world at the moment. It seems that there's a crisis in the soul of humanity. And when this crisis bubbles to the surface, we label it. In the 80s and the 90s, we used to call it stress or anxiety. And then we began to call it depression. But it seems to me that there's like a, a deep hopelessness in the human spirit at the moment that makes us feel so depleted of energy, so fatigued and so exhausted. And for many of us, it seems that the negative events in our world just never stop. And I can feel so emotionally drained and worn out because everything is so complicated and complex. And even there are so many difference, differences and conflicts with even those I'm closest to. And the result here is that like a a hopelessness about the self and about the world. And this creates such a deep sort of sense of tiredness, a lack of ability to face anything. You know, sometimes I reflect on these things myself and why is it that there's an epidemic of this hopelessness, this fatigue, in our beautiful world, in our incredibly beautiful world, there is so much beauty left. And yet it seems that so many of us are faced with these feelings. On the surface, it is such a competitive world where we're always trying to prove ourselves. It's such a judgmental world. 
Do you find sometimes whatever you do, you're judged, you're labeled, you're criticized? But if we go a little bit deeper, it's like there's no meaning or purpose in life today. Is life really about building up my bank account? Is life really about a big position in a big organization? Is that, is that why I'm here? And yet even if I explore even deeper, there's a lack of true love and belonging, which is to me the absolute beauty of human life, which gives us so much energy and enthusiasm. And probably if I go to the core of this epidemic of hopelessness and tiredness, what is sitting there? It's that I think we've based our lives on falsehood. And that means that we base our lives on everything temporary. Nothing is permanent. It's a <clears throat> temporary jobs and temporary wealth and temporary positions and temporary relationships and temporary health. And even if I can say a temporary body. And this creates just such a sense of fear and insecurity, which seems to be driving me driving everyone and creating this thought soup that we live in this world, this thought soup of exhaustion. It just all feels too much. And I wonder how you feel when you see all of this. How do you respond? <clears throat> because my experience is so many people are reevaluating life. What is really important at the moment in life? And Recently, I've been conducting groups of people and I asked them, what's most important for you? And you know what most people say, inner strength, inner power, to stand strong, to stand strong. And what they say is, we know what we want to change. I can see in my personality what I want to change. I know how I want to be. I know I want to be more loving and kind and respectful. I know what I want to let go. I want to let go of my negativity, etc. But the big question is really, what is, is really, you know, where do I get the strength? Where do I get the inner power? How can I really stand strong in such a challenging world? where everything is coming at me all the time. And to me, standing strong is at the heart of really a spiritual practice. It's really about what meditation is. <clears throat> and it's slowly with wisdom and love accumulating an inner strength to take responsibility for how I feel and stop projecting and blaming others. To really begin to have the strength to connect with my true self and begin to know who I am, be honest with myself and stop denying and really begin to see my beauty as well as the things I need to change. Inner strength is really something which is so important at the moment. And I would say it's an essential skill because what it really means is to stand strong means to stand in this world and not be influenced by the many, many powerful and negative influences. To stand in my self-respect, to stand in my, as my true self, and not only not be influenced, but hopefully <clears throat> begin to influence others and the environment around me in a positive way. And when I now look at our world, I come to three conclusions. Seeing the world now in 2022, my first conclusion is there's no turning back. Some people want to wind back the clock. You know, go back to the good old days. <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen. What we're going to see is more instability, more economic upheaval, more social transitions, 
more and more and more rapid change. And so my second conclusion is we need a new approach to life. Often we just, you know, do the same things because if I don't develop a new approach to life, all this change keeps knocking me over. I get up and then I'm knocked over again by this thing or that thing. And one thing which had a huge influence on my life, and often it's the most simple things, was when someone asked me the question, what do you have control over? Do you have control over the economy, the government? Of course not. Do I have control over my boss, my colleagues, my work environment? No. Do I even have control over my partner, my family? No. What do I really have control of? My sphere of influence is my thoughts, my attitudes, my behavior, my actions. And really on the journey to beginning to stand strong in this incredibly challenging world, I have to really understand that I can't change what's happening out there, but I can change my reaction to what is happening out there. And this is really what I would say spirituality is. And the third conclusion is I need a new wisdom. We're entering a time <clears throat> in this world where I really need to emerge what I feel is a wisdom that is sitting in me. And usually in life, we talk about three wisdoms. We have my intellectual ability. It's so important. It helps me understand the world outside, develop a career, make money. But when I do feel, when I do feel weak, when I do feel exhausted by life, when I do feel fear and anxiety, does this intelligence help? I don't think so. The second intelligence, which we hear about so much in the last 20, 30 years, is the emotional intelligence. Probably one of the most important things in life to feel, to have the ability to build rich, loving relationships with others. How essential is that for a quality life? But the real intelligence we need for these times is spiritual intelligence. If emotional intelligence is the wisdom to build rich, loving, sustainable relationships with others, spiritual intelligence is the wisdom to build a rich, loving, sustainable relationship with me. The first relationship in life is with me. If this relationship is dysfunctional, if this relationship is unhealthy, it pollutes each part of my life. <clears throat> it pollutes how I feel. It affects my physical health. It affects my relationships with you. It affects my performance in the workplace. Looking at our world outside, the chaos, <clears throat> which we're seeing in the world, where does it begin? To me, it begins in this first little space between me and myself, the first relationship in life. Because there's 8 billion human souls with such a dysfunctional feeling inside of themselves, how has that come out? How does that appear in the world? It appears as this sort of chaotic environment in which all of us are living at the moment. And so I would say that spiritual intelligence is a wisdom which helps me understand my inner world, which helps me connect with my resources internally, realizing that I can't do much externally, but I can do a lot internally, which will influence externally too. And it means that I really learn how to understand my mind, understand my heart, take responsibility, and even begin to stand strong in this incredibly challenging world. And there's a number of areas all of us need to stand strong so that life doesn't fatigue us. 
And I would say the first is standing strong, facing the crises we see in the world, whether it's social, economical, political, environmental, there's a shopping list, and I'm sure you don't want me to talk about them. <laughs> We've just had enough of all those things. <clears throat> but I would say to really begin to stand strong in this world, I have to stand strong in knowing and experiencing who I am. I have to reconnect with my fundamental self. And when I look inside of myself, in all my years of contemplation and reflection, what I've observed is there's three personalities inside of me. Two of them make me feel weak, vulnerable, and absolutely exhaust me, make me fatigued. But one of them starts to rebuild my inner strength and bring a new freshness back into my mind and my heart. The first personality I call the eye of arrogance <clears throat> or the eye of superiority. And this personality takes its whole sense of identity from my temporary body. I see myself as a whole set of labels, my gender, my nationality, my age, my education, my culture, hundreds of labels. But what's common to all those labels? They are temporary. And when this I, my ego, is ruling in my inner system, it creates a whole thinking and feeling structure inside of me. I compare with others and I think, I am better. I know more. I am right. The way I'm seeing life is correct. My perception is accurate. But when it comes into my feelings, when the ego is ruling my inner system, my inner kingdom, when it comes into my feelings, I feel so easily insulted, disrespected, not valued, excluded, sensitive. And all these emotions just drain me so deeply that it's like an extreme fatigue. But it really comes from the pressure I put on myself because of my ego. It comes from the expectations that I'm putting on myself because of my ego. And all the thoughts I have, like I have to do, the burden of responsibility, this heaviness, no matter what I do, even the good things in life make me feel heavy and burdened. I have to impress. I have to look good. I have to be noticed. All of this weighs heavily on the soul and sort of drains that essential spiritual sort of life. And so I feel flat, depleted, empty, exhausted. So the second personality which sits inside of me is the eye of lack of self-respect or the eye of inferiority. You can say the flip side of ego. This eye also takes its sense of identity from my temporary body and all my labels of my body. And when this eye is ruling my inner world, I think others are better, others no more, others don't love me, others don't value me, others don't respect me. And when it comes into my feelings, when my this inverted ego, this lack of self-respect, that's when I feel hopeless about myself, inadequate, not good enough, inferior, I would say depressed. In psychology, depression is like a sadness that my dream in life to be loved and valued and respected hasn't happened. But in spirituality, depression is like a mourning for the loss of my true identity. I'm living my life, but who am I really? And when, when this eye of lack of self-respect is ruling, more tiredness, more exhaustion, it's like I have done, the thought I have done, I carry this whole weight of my past. 
all the stories, all the mistakes, all the regrets, regrets. It's like a big shadow weighing on my mind and my heart. And it just makes me feel too tired. Or the thought, no matter how well I do, it is never good enough. And mostly I do so well, but it is never good enough. You know, once here in Sydney, <clears throat> I gave a meditation course to a woman who was the stage man manager of one of the world's great actors, comedians. And she was saying to me that he will finish a show with two, three, five thousand people and they love him. And everyone is saying, encore, encore, more, more. And every night, she said, after five encores, ten encores, he comes backstage and he says, was I good enough? Did they like me? <laughs> you know, they loved him. You know the feeling, no matter how well you do, there's always that self-doubt. It's not good enough, <clears throat> that self-criticism. And what happens is, Often we swing between the ego of superiority and the ego of inferiority. Up, down, up, down, the highs, the lows, the emotional roller coaster, which once again depletes that life force and that real enthusiasm for life. The third eye, I can say, is the original eye, the permanent self. I the soul. The soul is a wonder, an absolute wonder, because the soul exists, but the soul has no size. It has no length, breadth, or width. I once met a scientist who was like a Nobel Prize winner, and he said to me, the ultimate unknowable for science is a point, because it's beyond matter. The soul exists but it's not physical and you know recently science has said <clears throat> that this body has around nearly 40 trillion cells can you get your head around that i can't <laughs> just so many little building blocks that make up this body but i am something distinct i am the soul that sits and motivates this wonderful instrument. I, the permanent self, the real self, am eternal, immortal, I can never die, and non-physical. And when I start to sow the seed of this truth in my inner world, then these feelings inside of me, it's like I come home to a place inside where I feel so easy. I take the pressure off myself to look good, to impress, to be noticed. I begin to relax deeply. The intrinsic nature of the self is to be peaceful. It's my natural state. But when I forget my natural self, I become unnatural and my mind begins to overthink. And that also is a thing that drains me and exhausts me. And so sometimes I see my inner world like a tree. And we know a tree has a seed, a trunk, branches and leaves. My thoughts are like the leaves. You know, when you see a huge tree, a huge, huge tree, there's literally hundreds of thousands of leaves on that tree. It's like our mind, so many thoughts. But what's feeding those thoughts are the branches. And the branches are like my mental and emotional patterns. So many patterns that sometimes we have. Sometimes we're perfectionist. Sometimes we have, you know, a mental pattern, a bit paranoia, always fearing or reading things into situations or what what people are doing, so many mental and emotional patterns. But what's feeding the branches is the trunk. The trunk is like my subconscious, an extraordinary part of my inner anatomy, where I carry all the 
the impressions, the experiences of my past. But what is feeding the trunk, the seed, the roots? The seed of my inner world is my sense of identity, my sense of self, my sense of who I am. When I sow the seed of being a temporary body and all the labels, it influences my subconscious, the trunk. It will influence all my emotional and mental patterns. And the result, so much thinking on the surface, so much thinking, so much overthinking, so much worrying, so much anxiety. Why? Because the seed I've sown is false. To stand strong, I sow the seed of my permanent self. I sow the seed that I am an eternal soul. And when I sow that seed, it influences my subconscious. It influences my mental, emotional patterns. It influences my thinking. My thinking is calmer. My thinking is lighter. My thinking is clearer. And my thinking doesn't exhaust me anymore. So to change my inner world, I begin to change the seed of who I am. So I'm beginning to actually <clears throat> stand strong in myself by knowing and experiencing who I am. What is meditation? Meditation is actually taking the idea of the self and converting it into an experience. You know, around 80% of us believe we're something more than a body, but we don't experience it. The journey of spirituality, the journey of meditation is taking this truth and unpacking it, exploring it, researching it, so that I feel. Because the aim of meditation is not to be peaceful. That is the result. The aim of meditation is really to know and experience who I am and the automatic consequence is this. The whole inner world cools down, calms down, relaxes. I can taste true peace. So let us just for a few moments put down our pens and our devices and let's just begin to experience this first step of standing strong. Let me visualize myself as a tiny spark of life energy sitting in the front of the brain in the center of the forehead. This is I, the soul. The self that is eternal, immortal, non-physical. But over time, I forgot who I was. I became consumed in my temporary identity. All the labels of my body. And that seed changed everything inside how I feel and experience life. And let me begin a gentle process of letting go the temporary consciousness of my body and stabilizing in who I am. Let me let go identifying with what I do. My role as a parent, a partner, a colleague. Let 
That is what I do. It is not who I am. Now just lightly observe the image of your body in the eye of your mind. Observe all the labels your body represents, your gender, your nationality, your education, your religion, and more. Yes, my body is the wonderful instrument that I express through in the dance of life. But I am not all these labels. I am something more than these labels. Feel yourself stepping back, withdrawing. And feel yourself sitting so lightly in the forehead. I am a peaceful soul. The more I know and reconnect with my fundamental self, the speed of my mind cools down. the quality of my thoughts improve. I feel lighter. And I feel stronger within. And the quality of these peaceful thoughts, these loving thoughts, rekindles my enthusiasm, the fatigue begins to lessen. And when I begin to, thank you everybody, when I begin to really stand strong in my true self. You know, my own experience was a massive shift in the way I saw myself, the way I saw others, the way I saw the world. And the ultimate result is like a sense of self-respect returns in a natural way, not a contrived way, but a natural sense of self-value which is like the building blocks, the foundations of standing strong. But we not only have to face all the crisis in the world, but we have to stand strong in the face of an emotional crisis. You know, today, how challenging are human relationships? I think everyone listening and watching today will have so many stories of things which are quite hurtful, differences, conflicts, rejection, loneliness, separation, death. What can we say about all the things we're experiencing in human relationships at the moment? And you know, sometimes I think if you stand away from yourself as an observer and ask your heart, what fills me with power and strength and what drains me of power and strength. It's so easy. Just observe. My observation <clears throat> is when I have loving thoughts, my thoughts are giving respect, giving value to others, thoughts of self-respect, I feel strong. But as soon as I create a quality of thought which is of hurt and anger, and fear and blame and all that quality of thought, you feel depleted, you feel drained. I would say at the heart of standing strong 
is reconnecting with a quality of love in life that sort of rebuilds my foundation. You know, sometimes I think, you know, the under sort of the subtext of life is the search for true love, you know? <clears throat> and when we look at life, we invest our heart in relationships. It's the most natural thing to do. All of us do that. We give everything, <clears throat> but there's a huge human dilemma, a huge challenge that no relationship is permanent. Whether it's time, whether it's change, whether it's conflict, whether it's separation, whether it's death, the object of my love will go. And that has just filled us with so much fear of loss, fear of loss of the supports, the emotional supports which I receive in life. In life. And so much insecurity is there. You know, <clears throat> what is spirituality? You know, spirituality is really exploring a permanent relationship that is always there. And I sometimes think there's three sources of love in life, from the self, from the divine, from God, and from others. And from the self, as we've been saying, unfortunately today, very little love, self-respect is so low. So not much love from there, from God. You know, some people may have a belief in God and some people just don't want to go near God. It just, that's something which is a part of religion. And there's a whole lot of issues there. So my one source of love is my family, my friends. If there's a conflict, if there's a death, it's like my whole life goes into upheaval. What is spirituality? Spirituality says to stand absolutely strong in this incredibly changing world. First, I need a loving relationship with myself as a soul. And secondly, I need a loving relationship with the divine, with God. And as I said, some of us wonder, well, what's that about? But just to offer an idea that just as I am the soul, I am the soul that sits in the center of the forehead in the front of the brain. There is another soul that's like a pure soul that's not influenced by ego and lack of self-respect, a real living being. And in a sense, meditation is this communication between I, the soul, with the source of all the qualities that my mind requires to strengthen itself once again. An unlimited source of love, peace, power, joy, and more. And in a sense, I make a decision to turn my mind from all the things that drain me, deplete me, and exhaust me, and take a decision to turn my mind to a source that's going to fill me, make me feel complete, and create that sense of spiritual fullness inside. So in a way, meditation is a union of I, the soul, the permanent self, with, if I can say, like the lover of the soul, a real living relationship. It's not just a concept, an intellectual belief. I'm actually connecting with a real living being. And, you know, to be very open these days, you know, I think sometimes some of us love the idea, but, you know, meditation seems hard work. You know, everything in this world seems hard work. <laughs> and even meditation, you know, to sit down and wrestle with my thoughts. And I think, oh, can I really do this? I want the result. I want the peace. I want the enthusiasm and the inner strength. But is it easy? And this is why I really love the word remembrance or remembering. Why? Because remembering is the most natural thing to human consciousness. At every millisecond, I'm remembering. 
at the moment as you are listening to this, you may be remembering a family member. And when you remember, you three things happen. In a split second, instantly, beyond time, you connect. You connect with a memory, you connect with a person, you connect with a situation. The instant you connect, you're influenced by what you connect with. And thirdly, you have a feeling inside. And so if you, at this second, as we're in this online webinar, you connect with a child or a partner, if your relationship is good, the instant you connect, you're influenced by that good relationship and you feel calm and relaxed. But if you connect with somebody and that subtle thread of your mind connects with that person and you're in conflict, you're not getting on, instantly you feel heavy, you feel down, you feel a bit upset or even angry. And that floods through your inner mind. And the way I see life, it's almost like every millisecond I'm plugging in there. I'm influenced by that. I download that vibe. I'm plugging in here. I'm influenced by that. I download that vibe. Hence my inner world so up and down. And hence this sort of this incredible fatigue. What really spirituality says is to remember the divine so that the subtle thread connects with a source, a real source, a living source, a relationship. Relationship is the most natural thing. It's in our DNA to have relationship. And wherever the heart goes, the mind will follow. There's a natural concentration. And when I connect with a source, I'm influenced by that love, by that peace, by that lightness. And I live stream that divine energy, that pure energy into my inner world. And it's almost like I begin, to, you know, sometimes I think if I'm not happy, if I'm not feeling good, there's one question to ask myself. What have I been remembering? What have I plugged my head in? Sometimes I plug my head into a memory that's negative. I just dwell on it and then I wonder why I'm not happy. Really, <clears throat> if I want to stand strong, I've got to really see what am I connecting to? What is my mind dwelling on? And often, you know, when there's a strong account of the past, my mind is like pulled to that like a magnet. They did this, they said this, this happened. But actually, the more I connect, with the divine it's like you develop a willpower not to go there i just know that depletes me i know that fatigues me and i know now where i get strength and energy from and so in a sense i sit down and i begin to remember who i am that actually i'm something more than this temporary body i'm the soul and then i connect with a source of energy that's going to actually fill me up, replenish me, remove the fatigue and remove the tiredness. And I think that, you know, we're living in a world which is changing so fast. Honestly, I can't depend on ever, anything outside of me. It's all changing too fast. To stand strong, I've got to rebuild my inner world. And the two building blocks knowing and loving myself, knowing and loving the Supreme. And for maybe for some of us, that's really comfortable. And for some, that may not be. But can I suggest just experiment? No one has to believe anything, but experiment and see where, whether it works for you. Because I think to stand strong, you know, I really need to put a little structure into my daily life to sustain myself, to heal myself when I feel all that energy go and I feel fatigued. And for me, what I do is I wake up in the morning and I consciously try not to think too much about what happened yesterday, what I have to do today. No, I sit, I reconnect with my intrinsic self and I feel this incredibly calm, peaceful, 
almost, it just settle inside me, this sweet feeling. And then I connect with the divine and I allow myself to be loved. And I was offered the idea of I am a soul, God is another soul, but a pure soul. And that in a sense, yoga means union. It's a, it's a connection. It's a relationship. And the more I feel a natural, loving relationship, it's like a natural discipline. You don't have to force yourself. Love makes it much easier. So I would, I always like the path of love for me. That's what makes life a bit more natural and spontaneous. We see a physical world. You know, we see the buildings, the people, the trees, the sky. But there is another world. But we don't physically see it, but we feel it. And just imagine 7.9 billion human souls pumping out energy into the atmosphere, thought vibrations. We're filling the atmosphere with these vibrations. I often say to people, if you don't have a meditation practice regular, you absorb this atmosphere, this collective human mind, unfortunately, no one's to blame, it's not a criticism, is just spewing out anxiety, depression, fear, anger, hatred. It's just where the human spirit is at at the moment. It's filling the environment. Unless I have a spiritual practice and I take back the authority of my mind, in other words, I start to you know, rule my inner kingdom, I absorb all these vibrations. And then I, I wake up in the morning and I wonder why I feel flat. I wonder why I feel depleted. I wonder why I feel no enthusiasm. I feel down. I feel depressed. Because unfortunately, it's like, a, it's like a, a cloud over the whole world. The collective human mind is feeding the atmosphere in the world. And if I take responsibility for my mind, <clears throat> I can put a different energy back into the collective human mind, a more positive energy, I can say, um, a more peaceful energy, an energy of inner strength. You know what I've realized in my life, because I've spent most of it teaching meditation. And, you know, we can, there's two things. There's you know, confidence and self-respect. And you know, often we can be so confident in what we do and speaking, but it doesn't mean I like who I am. And I would say virtually all human beings suffer from this challenge of feeling okay, whether it's my childhood, whether it's my youth, my adolescence, whenever I We've lost our self-value. This is the absolute seed of all my issues. And when I think I'm a body, it breeds lack of self-respect. It fundamentally makes me feel inferior, not good enough, hopeless. But actually, when I start to practice, not just believe, practice when I meditate and then during the day that I'm actually a soul and when I meet others they're souls too but as I start to do that step by step I rebuild a stable sense of self-value a stable sense of self-respect and this is really I would say spiritual learning the learning in the world out there is we collect information we know so much information Spiritual education is taking one idea, who am I, going deeper and deeper and deeper. The deeper I go, the more I grow my self-respect back. I have to rebuild it step by step. This is the spiritual journey. It's a lifelong learning. And I can say from my heart, when I started, I was, <clears throat> I think like most people, you know, lacking self-respect, often feeling quite inferior often feeling not good enough, but as I've just had a consistent practice, I can say from my heart, I feel quite stable. 
And, you know, I have this little thing for myself that, you know, if I'm criticized, <clears throat> that doesn't matter, it's life. But what matters is if criticism makes me lose my self-respect. If I make a mistake, I'm going to make mistakes, that's life. But what matters is if the mistake makes me change how I feel about myself, I lose my self-respect. If I fail at something, I'm going to fail. We will all fail at certain things. I've failed many times. But if that failure keeps changing how I feel about myself, at the heart of a spiritual practice is rebuilding a stable sense of self-value. This is such a gift. As much as I have self-respect, I can respect others. As much as I have self-respect, I will be humble. As much as I have self-respect, I will be loving and others will love me. Really, it is the great gift, but you need to give it time. But self-respect is the gift of a spiritual practice.